Welcome everyone on the last talk of this conference. As this is the last one, I would really like to take the opportunity and raise a bit of the applause for the organizers here for such a great event. <laughs> My name is Mateusz Pusz. I am the chief software engineer at IPAM Systems. And I'm also the member of ICC Platforms Committee. It happened that I had a chance to work with low latency systems, and I would like to share my experience with you about this domain. But first, before I, I will continue, I would like to also thank to Carl Cook from Optiver and Chris Kolhoff, the author of the Networking TS, for sharing also their low latency, high performance um, suggestions on study group 14 boards. Study group 14 is the ICC++ committee board responsible for uh, low latency, high performance, gaming, and, and embedded domain. So thank you to those guys. We have better slides, more, more materials. We have better knowledge how low latency domain works. Before we talk about um, some details, we have to know what the latency and what's the throughput. Latency, latency is the time required to perform some action from the beginning to the end. It's measured in units of, of time, like hours, minutes, seconds, and so on. Throughput is the number of such actions happen, that happen during a specific time frame. So it's measured in, for example, units per time. When we talk about low latency, um, we can say that low latency is a delay that makes it human unnoticeable um, delays in the communication. And we can have here a few important uh, use cases for different, uh, mostly for the internet and, and networking connections. So it will be like voice over IP, online gaming, or trading platform. In case of voice over IP, Everybody knows that if the delay is too long, probably a bit more uh, in a matter of milliseconds, then it's hard to talk with somebody else on the other, well, other end of the wire, right? With online gaming, the restrictions are a bit more um, extreme here, so we need better connection to be able to um, beat other gamers. Even So even if you are the best gamer and you have bad connection, you will not be able to, to prove yourself there. But for Capital markets, um, it actually is not about the being, able, being able to be uh, hurt properly or, or to win the game, it's to earn a lot of money. Uh, there are a lot of companies doing the same, and only the fastest win, win some money from this one. So you have to be really, really fast. <coughs> High frequency trading is a program trading platform that uses powerful computers to transact a large number of orders at very fast speeds, according to Investopedia definition. They are using complex algorithm uh, to analyze many markets, to look for possibilities to gain some money. Um, they are buying and selling different um, securities, different, different instruments, many times during a period of time. Um, yeah, so basically the, the business is to, 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 to find some opportunities and, and get some money from it. And actually it turns out that many companies turn out their entire capital they have even a few times a day. So they trade more actions during a day that they are, that, that they are worth on the market by themselves, which is a lot of money being put every day on the market but back and forth. Yeah, and as I said, the fastest wins. How it looks from the point of view of, 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 of the exchange. Uh, this is our network that we have to connect to. We have to connect with as fast as we have to be, we have to have as fast connection as possible to the network, and we have to be as close to the network to be as fast. So it also is about connecting and about the position. Often high frequency trading servers are really close to the, to the source of the, of the exchange. We have a big wire that uh, connects us to the, to the exchange, provides a lot of data. 
and we have to do some market data processing. So we have to filter all of the messages that are important, uh, then parse those that may be important, and look for some opportunities. We are running trading strategies to find out if we can get money from it. Then we are checking if this actually is safe to do it, because uh, we cannot lose too much money on these ones. And then we are doing some actions. And if you, that, you, that action is possible to do, and, and we can make money from this one, we have to return this as fast as possible to the market, again, to be faster than the competition. So this one, from the very beginning, from the top to bottom, is the fast path. It's a, it's a good path of, of doing some money. In any case, if you find something that doesn't match you, you have to exit this path as, this path as fast as possible and, and start over again. How fast can we do? Well, for the software approach, we can make a trade in microseconds. And some companies are using hardware approach. I don't have actually much experience with hardware ones, but those are below microseconds. This is really, really fast. If you don't know how to realize it, for example, we are talking that blinking of an eye is like a really short period of time, yes? But actually, it's about something like a one third of a second. In one third of a second, we can handle, like, trade millions of orders in this blink of an eye time frame. It's a lot. And first of all, is the most important thing is to not trade as much as we can, but to, to, not, to not lose money on the market. Because it's really easy just to lose everything in a few seconds. So you have to make sure that anything is going wrong there, so everything is safe. You have to have good tests and make sure that you have good scenarios for handling different situations. There is a famous example of Knight Capital, which was one of the biggest players on the market in 2012. It has 17% of, of market share on NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. Uh, it was worth at this time about 365 millions of dollars, and the daily trading volume of this company only was 21 billion dollars, so my, much, much more than they, they own by themselves. And due to some unfortunate issues and, and, and events that happen, they nearly went out of, of, the, of the market in 45 minutes. You can read more on the internet about this, but this was uh, um, yeah, a series of events. Basically, it happened that they had some module of the application that was not used for a long, for long time, it was disabled, it, and uh, then it was cut to pieces because it was reused to some other features. No one ever tested this because it was disabled. No, no messages coming to the, to the server were using this part of the software. And like many years after, they written something similar. So they thought, we'll reuse the same flag in networking message to, 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 en to enable similar functionality. And they wrote a new functionality that was enabled by this flag. But during putting this on the servers, they had like eight servers as possible for this, for, for this functionality. They put new code to seven, but forgot about the older one. So now new messages came. They entered seven servers were working fine, and the eighth one was handling orders in a wrong way with, with totally cut to pieces feature. So it was even functional a few years ago, but it's not, an, uh, not anymore because it was not tested for many, many years. So when they found out, they were trading millions of orders that they didn't expect. And they were trying in a hurry to, uh, to fix this stuff. So they no, knew, knew that, the, that the problem was, was in, introduced by the last upload to the server. So what they did? They removed all of the seven servers with new software, leaving the old one there that was producing even more bad orders at the same time. And yeah, so it may look funny, but they lost a lot of money because of it. Uh, they were able to shut down the, the service in 30, 45 minutes, but they were bankrupt nearly at this, at this time. So this is what, what something, if something goes wrong, this is what can happen for you in this market. You are earning money for many years, and you can bankrupt in 45 minutes. When you're writing a low-intensity software, actually C++ is not your um, biggest weapon to use. 
first of all, you have to have really good system. You have to have good network connection, and you have to be close to the market, as I said. Uh, you have to use modern hardware. When you have both of those, you have to profile this. You have profile BIOS, you have to profile kernel, you have to profile OS. And only then, you can suit your hardware for low latency stuff, because by default, all of the hardware and all of the, let's say, even programming languages are suited for high performance, no dot latency. Those are sometimes or often different aspects here. So you don't care about throughput here. You are um, really want to make things as soon as possible, as fast as possible for one item, and to make it deterministic. Uh, I will not talk too much about the hardware here. I have only one slide about it because this is not a talk about hardware. But as some suggestions, I can say, first of all, you never sleep in software or in hardware. So you are doing busy spins. You want to start processing something as soon as possible and finish processing something as soon as possible. So you just don't sleep. Uh, you don't run many threads because threads in in increase throughput but actually decrease the low latency stuff. You have to disable all of the locking and thread support. You have to disable power management, all of the things that actually make your computer more um, powerful, but like less deterministic in, um, in, in, in this sense. You have to pin your software and, 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 and your, your functionality to specific parts of your computer. You have to ask a CPU affinity, interrupt, use NUMA nodes in a correct way, and so on. And also, we are trying to replace all of the kernel stuff with user mode to not, um, yeah, to not have to not to have to pay for the communication between between user mode and kernel mode. So one of the most important things here is to change the networking drivers to basically um, bypass the kernel while while working with the network. But let's scope on software. Right, because we are here on the C++ conference and we want to talk about software. Typically, only the smart of the code is really important here. Only a part of it is a, is a fast path. All other is, is error handling and, and, and reporting and whatever. This code is not executed often, but when it's executed, it has to start as soon as possible. That's why we cannot sleep. We are doing busy spins. And it has to finish as soon as possible. So if only you find something that doesn't match your, your um, ideas and, and your plan, you quit from this fast path, do something maybe in different thread, in this, on different processor, but you're coming back sp busy spinning for another opportunity. Everything has to have a predictable and reproducible uh, performance. So you have to have low jitter, low variation of your, of your time of processing. As I already said, multi-threading increases latency. It's about throughput and not low latency. So we try to not use it. Even if you're using one, even one thread on different cores, you are maybe reusing some parts of the cores in a concurrent way, but still, uh, all the caches b above L1 are shared, all of the buses are shared, network is shared, and so on. So that's why some companies even use only one CPU on their eight CPU computers because of it. And as you've seen on the previous slides, mistakes are really expensive. You have to make sure that you have good procedures, good error testing, good unit testing of your code. A lot of people ask me, because I'm also a trainer, how to develop software that have predictable performance. But it turns out that the more important question is not how to develop it, but how to not develop it. In uh, low latency, we care about worst case execution time. So we're not like measuring average, or we are not measuring the, the, the fastest possible solution. We are measuring the worst one to make sure that the jitter is as small as possible. And I would say that task not only for C++ developers, but also for architects. If you have bad architecture, you will not be able to, uh, to, to approach and, and have this um, functionality, this, this performance in, in your software. So both parties here have to, um, have to consider performance low latency from the very beginning of the, of the existence of the, of the product. 
So talking how not to develop things on the fast path, there are a few things that you should uh, not use. First of all, you shouldn't use tools that trade um, the performance for usability. Such examples are, for example, stud shared pointer or stud function. I love stud function for slow path, but on the hot path it has some cost. You shouldn't throw an exception on a likely code path, so on the hot one. You should not use dynamic polymorphism, multiple inheritance, RTTI, dynamic model locations, and we'll be talking about those a bit more on the next slides. These are the things to um, to limit in your code on the fast path. So why shared pointer? Shared pointer seems to be a really nice, friendly to developer type, right? It does everything. It has really simple use cases, really simple usage, interfaces, and so on. And this is why this is often overused by C++ programmer. Um, let's see what's the difference between those two parts of code, which looks pretty simple. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I hope so. If not, we can make it a bit bigger. This is unique pointer, right? We have like about eight lines of assembly code here. Pretty simple stuff. How do you think? How much it will be if I change it to shared pointer? Twice? Who, who give more? Thousands? No, thousands may be too, too big. Let's see. This is shared pointer. 100 on this compiler. And there are some in, in interesting aspects here. We have, for example, two allocations here. One allocation is for four bytes, so this is probably our integer. And we have another allocation for 24 bytes. This is our state. So the state of shared pointer has 24 bytes. We can find here, uh, for example, log, because of the atomic operations being done there. We can find later on things like, uh, actually, this one is a virtual function that was devirtualized by, by GCC. But for example, Clank is not able to, to reason, uh, reason about it, even in the latest version. Next, we have another virtual function. This one is not devirtualized. We have another log, and we have try catch block, actually in a constructor that everyone uses. And V tables. There are V tables in shared pointer. You pay for polymorphism every time you're using shared pointer. So this is why we should refrain from using tools like shared pointer in a performance uh, require, like performance uh, de demanding software and, and paths. Why the shared pointer is so slow? Uh, first of all, because there was a decision that, uh, yeah, first of all, it has um, shared, um, shared um, resources design here, yes? So it has shared ownership design. For this, we are having this uh, the state base. This is the, the state that is being shared between shared pointers and weak pointers. It provides two counters, atomic counters for number of shared pointers, number of weak pointers. Together with a V pointer, it forms 24 bytes that we've seen. You probably know that unique pointer takes the deleter in a, in a class type. I don't know why we didn't use this for the shared pointer. Uh, we just have T here, and if you want to provide delete and allocator, it's typed erased. So basically it means that we are paying for dynamic model allocations and for, or for polymorphism here in order to, in, to introduce this functionality for us so we don't have to type it in a type. So we have here shared state that affects our performance and memory footprint and design too. Memory synchronization that affects performance. Type erasure that affects performance. Weak pointer support. Even if we don't use weak pointers, we are paying for it by a bigger size here. So it's memory footprint. And we have also aliasing constructor. This is something that we have two pointers here. Here and here. 
there are two pointers, and actually that ca they can be sent, set to two different values and even two different types, which is strange, but there are some use cases for it. I would not talk much, uh, much more about it. If you would like, then you can refer to my talk from Code Dive 2016. I spent more than nearly 90 minutes talking only about short pointer, why, why it's bad. And if you would like to know more, you can go there. Exceptions. Many people try to measure exceptions, and the result is nearly of always the same. The exceptions do not introduce any significant runtime overhead, like any I mean measurable significant runtime overhead for most of the configurations. The noticeable exception is Windows 32, as it uses older version, but we don't care about this target probably anymore too much. However, this is true only if exceptions are not, are not thrown. So you should use exceptions only for exceptional situations, not for error handling or, or, or validation like validation of the user input. Because throwing an exception can take significant and non-deterministic time, which actually is a big problem for this domain. However, there are a lot of advantages of exceptions, and they t tend to be used because of it in the software. They cannot be ignored. They simplify interfaces. Um, if they are not thrown, they actually can improve application performance, because there is le less branching, there's better separation on, of, of the cold and hot path. And People claim that exceptions are hard to reason about because people don't know which functions can throw which one, which one. I would say that actually it's easier. Just assume that every function can throw. And prepare for it with RIAI idiom. If you will assume that every function can throw, it makes your code much easier. And you are like safe for the future because it may not throw today, but it, it may throw in a quarter or tomorrow. So if you assume that every, everything can throw and you are using RRI everywhere, you are writing not only thread-safe code, but you are writing correct code. Because even if you are not allowed to use exceptions in your code, you should, it shouldn't be an excuse to write not exception-safe code. This was, an, this was a problem that, for example, good Google co coding time introduced like about 10 years ago, I think, that exceptions are bad, please don't use exceptions. So people were not using exceptions, they are writing the code in a non-exception way. And even though people from Google know right now that exceptions are great, they cannot enable this feature in their code base because no one will be able to refactor it in order to make it correct. So even though, uh, even if you cannot use exceptions, please write exception-safe code. It makes your code much better to use because exception is only one of the, altern al of, of the different return paths in your function. If you have like early returns, different branches, RRI will just use it, ju just work for you. You don't have to remember where you have to make, like, delete, delete, or delete, uh, or F close, or whatever in your code. An exception is just one more early return type, early return statement in your code. That's about exceptions. Polymorphism. Polymorphism, as you know, can be implemented in this way. This is typical, uh, let's say, I think it's temp factor method pattern, template method pattern. And, and it uses polymorphism. You have non-copyable type that has virtual destructor, some virtual functions, and you implement them in derived classes. It has a few issues. Most people say that the biggest issue of polymorphism is that you have dereference pointer. It's actually not the case. The referencing of the pointer takes a few CPU cycles. Yes, that's true. But actually, the problem is that if you dereference this pointer, you end up with the V table. And only V table will provide you the information what is the code to execute. Because be before the you dereference this pointer, you don't know what to execute. And it's by you, I mean the CPU, I mean your machine, your, your hardware. So if your code do not know what, what to execute, it doesn't know what to prefetch to instruction cache. If it doesn't know what to prefetch to instruction cache, it's not ready for you. If it happens that actually instruction cache, which is pretty small, do not contain your code at this time, you have to wait like 300 cycles just waiting for, for the CPU to, to, to do this for you. And I can assure you, you can do a lot of stuff in 300 cycles. And this is a problem with polymorphism. 
And of course, if you cannot know what will be run, you cannot devirtualize. You cannot inline the stuff. So you're also paying for, 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 for function call there. So this is the biggest problem of the polymorphism, not just the reference of the v-pointer. There are some alternatives. You can use like things like static polymorphism here. Of course, it will not replace all of the use cases for this dynamic one, but can replace some of those. This is CRTP pattern, curiously recurring, recurring term plan parameter idiom, where you provide derived type to the base type. Then this pointer is the same for both, and you can cast base pointer to derived pointer and use those functions from the child class directly. Other use cases, for example, you can use variant or similar approaches to, to provide polymorphism. Another use case is multiple inheritance. So if inheritance is wrong or polymorphism is wrong, multiple one is even worse. Yes, you have to adjust this pointer for both accessing the data and functions of class B if this one is not empty. And of course, the biggest problem is when you have diamond of dread problem. For this, you have to use this virtual inheritance uh, feature, but I claim that this one is broken. I don't like it really, and I probably never use it. Why I claim it's broken? Because if you will like, consider that there is no C class here, base A and B is totally valid polymorphic tree. You may have like thousands of those in a polymorphic flat polymorphic tree, right? And now comes one customer to you saying, I would like to inherit from A and B. Please make all of your thousand class virtual, virtually deriving from, from base because I may want to use two of them and derive from both of them. And I say that's why I think it's broken because those guys have to pay for, for this guy coming here. So you have to make all of well, like 1,000 polymorphic children classes uh, having virtual polymorphism only because someone may, may come and say, I want to derive from both. And besides, this is really hard to use feature. If you ever did it, I don't recommend you to, you, you, know, you know how hard it is to, to, to live with it. So I always prefer composition before inheritance. If you're working with multiple inheritance, work only with interfaces. Hello? Yeah. So I think that my batteries are dead. Sorry for that. OK. So next on the line is run -time run -time, run -time type identification, RTTI. And with this, basically, um, it sometimes happens that you have a polymorphic class. And you have some interface here. But then you derive and extend the interface. If you have something like this, first of all, it means that you have some smelly design. This is something that we shouldn't have in the design. And to use this interface, you have to dynamic cast the derived type, and base cast to derived type, verify if it's, if it's successful, and, and then you are using the derived type. Dynamic cast takes also a lot of time, and it's also not a deterministic one. As I said, also, this kind of design means that you are probably doing something wrong. This one is not deterministic because it uh, uses the traversing of the inheritance tree and a lot of comparisons. If you really want to do this, this is probably the faster way to do it, but still, I don't recommend this design type. Memory, talking about the memory allocations. Uh, the default allocator is a general purpose allocation, general purpose operation. So it means that it has to serve both to allocate one byte of memory and one gigabyte of the memory. If something has to be so flexible and generic, in many cases, it's not the best solution for anything. But I don't claim that this one is slow or you should always write your own because it's not that easy. One of, my, one of my customers said, we are good engineers, we de develop our own. It has to be faster. Did you measure? No. I measured. It was twice as slow as the default one, and it was not thread safe. <laughs> <laughs> so
So always measure before you make such judgment. It's a general purpose one, but it doesn't mean it's slow. But probably you may make it faster for some use cases. Also, it has non-deterministic execution performance. What I mean by this is that in most cases, allocation succeeds and you basically can get things pretty, pretty fast. But from time to time, you are out of the kernel memory, kernel page, and you have to ask kernel for another page. And that, that takes time. It is not deterministic because it happens only from time to time. As you are working on the, all, all of the area of the memory, it causes fragmentation. So it may turn out that you may have a lot of free memory, like one gigabyte of the memory, but you cannot allocate half of it in a contiguous way if you ask, ask for the half of the gigabyte buffer of the memory. So you have allocation failure then. And yeah, there may be memory leaks if you are not using smart pointers. So answer to this might be um, custom allocators, especially arena allocators that w are pretty famous lately. Just go and look some John Lacos talks or maybe Andreas Weiss talks from other conferences, pretty good ones to, 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 uh, to know more about arena allocators. Basically, they're using low number of dynamic memory allocations because they pre-allocate on startup. And, but however, the housekeeping is pretty, uh, pretty much harder in this case. The interface allocator looks like this one. It's pretty simple. It does have an allocate function and deallocate function that, that takes a pointer that was allocated and the size with which was allocated. This size delete is a pretty new thing. It was added, I think, in 14 or, or something like this. Uh, that basically with this you are, it's faster to find a pool to release this pointer. And then you can provide your own allocator to a string and alias this as a pool string and just use it in your code. Pre-allocations in this case makes the jitter more, more, more stable because you are working, uh, you, don't, you are not referring to dynamic allocations to the kernel pages anymore. It also keeps related data together, so it's better from cache, cache friendliness. And it also limits the fragmentation because you're not working on all the memory at once. But if you cannot allocate, or you don't want to have any branches there, uh, you may go for small object optimization pattern, right? So to prevent the dynamic memory allocation for common use cases. Typical use case here is, for example, for strings. This is GCC implementation. It has 32 bytes of of size of, at only at 60 bytes of, of uh, SSO buffer here. So from the implementations I know, from the most common ones, this is probably the bigger one, the biggest one, uh, as a string, and the smallest, uh, smallest string optimization buffer there. Um, it works as follows: during default construction, you just point data to to this one. And if it turns out that the string has to be bigger, then you allocate something in the outer memory, and capacity stores the, the amount of memory that was dynamically allocated. As I said, this one is the biggest one in terms of, of size and, and smallest in terms of the buffer, but it's also the fastest one from the, from the runtime point of view because, because all of the functions like begin and index operator size just refer to those members without any branches. The only branch you have is in the capacity function here. There are other designs, like for example from, from Facebook library, or I think Clank is using a similar one, where for example size of is 24 bytes, and all of those bytes can be used for internal buffer. It's pretty nice design, and yeah, you can look for it because it's tricky also. But then, then every member function has to check for a branch to, f to verify in which mode I'm working, in, working with right now. But still here, you have some branches and you may end up with dynamic memory allocation at, at some point. If you don't want to do it, you may use in-place string, for example. This is the type that is commonly used in this domain. If your um, strings are short, like identifiers that are fixed by the protocol, then you can use those. And then a structure can look like this one, that you have some contract or contact with a symbol, name, surname, company. And as you can see, every type here is smaller in size than to string by GCC. 
Also, what's really fun, really fun here is that this type has alignment of one. So even if those are not like octets size, because always plus one here, it will align nicely to memory and use cache better. So if you, even if we have here size like three, seven, five, and whatever, it aligns in contiguous memory. So using better your memory. And never you are paying, you're never here paying for dynamic memory location, but however, you may have bigger more, more memory usage if you put something like 1024 here as a size, right? So it's only for short strings. So these are basically the things that you shouldn't do on the fast path. Things you, that you can do, first of all, use tools that improve efficiency without sacrificing the performance. Use compile time wherever possible. Know your hardware. Clearly isolate code path from the fast path. And those rules are the most important for thinking about, about writing low latency code. Talking about the features that improve efficiency, here is a short list, but it's much longer. Static asserts, auto, type aliases, move semantics, no accept, consexp, lambdas, type traits, string view, veridic templates, and many, many more. There are a lot of features that you can use. It's really only a few things that you shouldn't do. <coughs> Talking about compile time safety, compile time performance. The fastest programs are those that do nothing. Do you agree with this one? And I also heard during my training that those are the fastest to write. <laughs> um, in C++ 98, to write a function, for example, like factorial, you had to write such a code. It could run with a compile time non constant and with runtime constant, and it was never compile time code. To, to postpone something, to move something to compile time, we had to do this template metaprogramming stuff. And with template metaprogramming stuff, it was yeah, like a dark, dark magic of C++. It was really slow to compile, and the syntax was different for runtime and compile time. Also, you had two different separate implementations of those. If you have two different separate implementations, then we have two different separate bugs in your code, which is really hard to, 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 to make proof later on. So what we are doing for many years instead of this one, because this was hard and complicated. Do you recognize this one? This is what we did for many years. It's easier to write circuit algorithm in Excel rather than in template metaprogramming world. Take the data, hard code them in code, and just use them. Of course, you had the same problems. Two different algorithms, two different set of bugs, hard to maintain this stuff. With C++11, we got concepts, right? That declared that it is possible to evaluate the function at compile time. <coughs> concept specifier used in an object declaration implies const, what we talked today in the morning during, 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 during keynote. And concept specifier used in a function or static member variable de defines is as inline. So with this, you may create a context function and use it to initialize array size. In C++11, we had a short list of things that we are allowed to do. It had to be one expression, um, and it couldn't mutate any state of any object. Plus, we could use some static assets and using aliases. And that's all. So in order to make branches, we had to do ternary operators. In order to do loops, we had to do recursion. So a bit like functional language. But with this, we have the same syntax and the same implementation for both, for runtime and compile time code. So we can initialize compile time things like here, or have our pre-computed values here, make a static assert, or run it with a possibly compile time uh, evaluation here. With C++14, actually the short list of things that we cannot do was replaced with a short list of things that we can do. Sorry, yeah, the vice versa. We had a short list that we can do. Right now we have short list that we cannot do in C++14. So this is all of the things that we cannot do in, in C++14 code. So with this, this code started to be much more similar to the code we are used to write every day. 
With C plus 17, some of the features were more simplified. With C plus 20, that comes to market soon, the list is really, really short. We can do nearly everything there. We can use dynamic model locations, for example. And there are other things that were removed from here. Like we can use dynamic casts and virtual functions. It's insane what we can do in compile time right now. <coughs> but still, for example, for cases like this one, you are not sure that if it will run in compile time or runtime, because it depends from the compiler. So it's maybe compile time. But today, again, during keynote in the morning, we've learned that we have new type keyword in C20 called, called const eval. With this, we are sure that this code will run in compile time, but then the runtime code will not run at all with this one. However, const evals are also consex functions. So, so you can use consex function to implement, to implement const eval and use the same implementation for both. And then here, use this consex function here, just force the const eval function to run. But we cannot overload on those. So we have to have provide different names. Talking about compile time code, it's not ob only about uh, like uh, calculation stuff, like const exp. It's also about branching, for example. So you may have uh, type traits, like is array, that verify if something is an array. And then you may provide um, entry point for, for a user, like to destroy in smart pointer, and take is array uh, type trait, create the value of it, and create two overloads that are either of type true type or false type. This one will work with, with arrays, this one will work with uh, one single element that was allocated during the smart, for the smart pointer. With this, you have compile time dispatch that will basically resolve during compile time. There will be no branches in the code. You will, this, all of this will be inlined, and it will work as fast as possible for each case, and it will be always safe. With C++17, we are allowed uh, to do variable templates here and, and use if concept too. Actually, variable templates are C++14. They make the same functionality as previous class templates, uh, but it's a bit faster to compile such code. Uh, and for both cases, for this um, type traits and let's say variable traits here, you can use the same mechanism, if consex, to make the same dispatch as it was on the previous screen, but in one function here without creating additional overloads, which again may increase a bit compile times, but from functional point of view, it's exactly the same. Another interesting case is uh, when you're having such a structure. I work in with, a few, with a few companies that basically they are defining such structures, and then they are doing memcopy on those. And probably many of us did such stuff. Uh, I spoke with those engineers while you are doing those, and they said, we know what we are doing. We are good programmers, right? <coughs> but actually, they are playing with really, really hard and, 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 and uh, dangerous tools. <laughs> uh, so. It happens, at least once for my customer, that this structure was changed to this structure after sometimes during maintenance. It still compiles comp 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 fine, and sometimes even works fine. It just doesn't work in production, strange. So, uh, use std copy for this one. std copy provides you negative overhead abstraction. It will know in both cases, what to do. If it can do a memcopy, it will do memcopy for you, as you can see here. If it cannot do, it will just do copy constructor and will do the safe, way, safe thing for you. Because it also uses this um, compile time dispatch that we've seen on previous slides. If you really, really want to do this with memcopy, just make sure that you put things like this together with your, with your type in a header file. Just type it explicitly. This type is meant to be trivially copyable. Then, in this case, compiler will compile fine. Here, you have a static assertion saying that someone just violated invariance of your class. 
So if only possible, if your class has any invariants, you had some design purpose for it, for specific usage, make it explicit in a header file together or right below this, this structure saying what you expect from this, from this class to be. So everyone looking at this class knows about what, what, what's it about, and if it breaks it, it's enforced during compile time to, to prove it, that, that it's wrong. Another interesting use case that we've seen uh, with, with our code that we wrote for, for, for trading is that if you have things like order book and for training, you have two sides of those, bits and asks. And those are using, a, they are all different sides of the uh, price market, let's say. So for this, you may use things like conditional. There's another type of side trade that depending on the size that is compile time known here, side, you may use either greater or less for comparisons. And with this, you can reuse code and just use the type provided here. So you may do another, time, another, another uh, flavor of compile time branching here. Talking about performance, what is wrong here? Me? Complexity? <laughs> cache friendliness, right? Reckless cache, usage can, reckless cache usage can cost you a lot of performance here. But do you know how much actually it is? This is my, my laptop, this one that I'm right now using on. And how do you think? How much slower is the slower case? I know that's really late right now, so to wake up and to not fall asleep, please everybody stand up and we'll do some exercise then. <laughs> I don't want you to sleep here. <laughs> so I, if I will show some, some answers on the, on the screen. I will also tell them, tell them because maybe people in the back will not see them. If you think that's right, just sit down. So if you think that both cases will be similar, just sit down. No one. If you think it will be like less than two times difference, slow down, sit down. Now one, five times. You like to stand. 10 times? Okay. 20 times. 50 times. 100. More than 100. More than 100. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Actually, for my computer that I measured, that I showed you specs on the previous slide, it was 42 times. For GCC 7.4. But it was also the same for GCC 9.2. So you could just sit down at the, in the very beginning. How it happened? Uh, actually, the compiler is able to deduce this pattern right now to recognize it, and it's replacing the code for you. <laughs> but, but, but this is only for simple cases. For more, more complicated, I would assume that you should still design your code in, like, with cache friendliness in mind. But the same algorithm, just written in a different way, 42 times on my machine. Think about it every time you, you are writing, writing the, your, your data. And why it's that? These are, these are the statistics. This is the slow one, this is the, the, this is the fast one. This is the kernel um, profiling tool from Linux. You can find here that the slow one executes only 0.2 instructions per cycle, while this one nearly one and a half. This is the uh, bandwidth or, 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 or yeah, throughput of the L1 memory. L1 cache, the smallest one, the fastest one. Only 28 mega, megabytes per second here. And this one is 250 because nearly everything is found there. This is number of cache misses of L1 cache. This is number of loads from last level cache. The same amount of, of data is loaded from the L1 cache as from the, from the last one. 
In this case, there's really nothing there left because everything is a small, lower caches, caches. So this is why you have more than 40 times difference on those cases. And think about it every time you design your software. Another similar use case is if you're doing like, for example, object-oriented game engine. A game engine works in, a, in phases. So you either draw or, make, or verify the game logic, for example. You're not doing this like, like per object, but you're doing this per steps for every object. Let's assume that you have like one million objects here. We have something called object manager because we love managers. And we have draw and verify functions that work on coordinates or some threshold. This is game logic, this is drawing phase. And you have game loop. This is the biggest game loop. It first draws and then verifies some game logic. You can write, write it in this way that's object, object manager that has structure, that's object, that has some coordinates, it, it has some, some cold stuff like error texting, like, like, like textures, like voices, like things that you put in the back during, during your travel through the game. And you have this threshold somewhere. Hello, hello. Yes, this is working one. I hope this is the last one, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, probably this is the high time to finish this conference, so I will try to be brief, uh, because yeah, all of the batteries are, are left already and went for a beer, and there's a lot of beer waiting for us, as I've heard. So uh, if you want to go and get this position and threshold, you are just getting in index of the object and getting coordinated threshold, which again makes really unfriendly access pattern. Here. So with data-oriented design, uh, there were uh, quite, a, quite a few talks about it, really nice ones. Mike Acton provided one on CPPCon a few years ago. I really recommend you going there and, and, and listen to it. This is the design that focuses on the data layout and results in many cases as with object decomposition, which actually make it harder, makes it harder to, to design, to maintain, but it makes it much, much faster. So as an example here, you may have a vector of coordinates, vectors of, of thresholds, and vector of core data here. And if you want to iterate through the, through the positions, you just iterate through, the, uh, through this one, through this vector. For game logic, you iterate through this, those, those vectors. But the problem is that right now your object is distributed among three different containers, and actually the index determines you the object. And now think, for example, that you want to like sort those collections according to distance from, for example, from, from, from a tree or from a person. You have to sort all of the vectors the same way. It starts to be hard to maintain. There are some patterns to, to work with it, but basically it makes your maintenance harder, but performance faster. Another point that may be interesting here is that member orders might be important. We have two structures here with the same members inside, but ordered differently. What is the size of and align of, of A and B? So for A, we have 16. This, this one is one byte, this one is two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes, and it happened that there's only one byte of padding here because of alignment provided here. Here we have exactly the same because, because static doesn't count, but I'm, the order is different, so alignment here forces us to have seven bytes of padding here and two bytes of padding here, so we have nine bytes of padding for 24 bytes of, of data, which makes your structures bigger, which is, uh, first of all, worse for uh, memory usage, and it's also worse for performance because cache usage is, is worse. So you may think about this, but also do not be uh, like only focused on this one during class design. This is only a structure that is using like for thousand times in your database. Not every object has to be cache friendly, right? But if you're storing this like, like in many, many instances in some database, it should be aligned similar to this. Also, be aware 
that this is the case from the previous slide. If you put it to an optional, for example, optional makes it, it only has a bool there, one bit that matters to find out if it's set or not. But due to alignment, you have those 16 bytes here of data and nearly all of the bits of padding again. With one optional, it's not an issue. But now consider that you have an array of optionals. And now you just multiply the, the padding many times. So for this optional, for databases, optional may not be the best solution. So be aware of the implementation details of tools that you are using. As you've seen for shell pointer, right now for optional, I love optional for interfaces, but for databases, it may not be the best tool. Also, there is a possibility that you can pack your structure. I learned from Timur's talk some time ago that this actually may make your code faster rather than slower. That we, this is, and we used to think about this as a slower case. Smaller, but slower. But actually, it's not the case. Uh, the latest uh, hardware architectures for PCs uh, actually make it as fast as, as for this case. And as this is CPU cache more friendly, it may actually be faster in your code. But as I said, for modern PC hardware, if you're working with ARM, if you're working with Android, you may even have some problems, some crashes even of the, of, of the operating system. Talking about the latency numbers and, and performance, these are the latency numbers that you should be aware of. L1 cache, half of nanosecond. L2 cache reference, 40 times that. L main number reference, 200 L1 cache reference. So our memory is layout in speed and also with size because L1 is the smallest one. Another interesting use case is this piece of code from uh, flat buffers library. Uh, this was a library that I work for, worked with in my project and I did some profiling and I found out that it really doesn't prove right in, with the performance. What that happens is this branch here. This branch basically is similar to the branch in pushback. If the preallocated size is too small, capacity is too small, you have to extend this to, to a bigger size. But first of all, we always do uh, like reserve before, so we know that it will never be taken, this branch, uh, in, the, in, in our code. So this code actually is never executed, but it makes this function much more harder to reason about and trashes instruction cache. So I submitted pull request that basically did, did that. I just extracted this functionality to a, to a separate function. And with this, we got 20% of improvement. So code is data too. It's instruction cache, half of it. Half of, half of L1 cache is instructions. You have to think about it also while designing code for low latency and high performance. So talking about different strategies to, to align the code. This is typical case of validation algorithm. You get some request, you maybe return error, and you handle the type of the request, right? Type one, type two, type three. You are doing some checks, if it's good or not. If not, you make a lot of code to uh, create an error message, like even string stream may be involved here to generate a message. Right, so only one, one line of the check in most cases and a lot of code to, to make error handling. So again, this is multiplexing cold path and hot path in the, in the function. So you can replace it in this way. You can replace it with is valid function and make error function. Is valid basically makes a switch and just do the checks and returns true or false. Make error just creates an errors for you. Notice that you have to pay twice for um, switch iteration here. But basically this one is done only when error happens. You are on the slow path, you don't care. And it happens really rarely. This is the common case, the fast path. So you are doing more work, but actually the resulting code is faster. 
theoretically doing more work, yes? Because this, this work nearly never happens. Also, another case for layering your code. If you have two checks to verify, you may put an expensive, so long, long test that you may have to make a lot of instructions to execute first, and then second one. We know that this expression has a short circuit cutting, right? So if this one will, will, will be false, this one will never be checked. So you may consider putting fast check first and bail out from this function as fast as possible without checking for the second one if, it, if it's false already. It also helps with the performance. Probably the last thing to notice about, about the code. Uh, if you will have a simple function like this one with loop for two We have more batteries. Okay, uh, how many batteries do we have? <laughs> um, okay, so this is the same code. Uh, the only the type is different. This is signed integer, this is unsigned integer. Uh, actually, if you will think about assembly of the code, it seems that compilers are really smart. Actually, compilers think about this loop in this way. They know this is 10, this loop is 10. This loop is also 10, probably, but also it has to do some more work. Why is that? Because uh, unsigned integer arithmetic overflow is, is defined behavior. This one is undefined, so compiler doesn't have to check with every addition here um, if we overflowed. So we are checking for, for a case that probably will never happen every time we do this, we do this loop in this case. Here we're just ignoring the fact that it may overflow, and users should just take care about it that should, it shouldn't overflow. So prefer doing integer arithmetics on signed types rather than unsigned ones. Okay, as, as I said, it's probably the end of the code right now. So how to develop systems with low latency code? First of all, I'll, um, avoid uh, some Mm, utilities that trade performance for usability. Also avoid types that maybe were really great in the times where they were designed, like in 90s. I don't want to say that list is broken when it was created by, by Stepanov. And this time, probably cache miss was like five to 10 cycles. Right now it's 300. Times changed. And that's why std list or std map are not the best containers to use. Unordered map is broken too, because it's stood list in the, in, uh, under the hood. Prefer stud vector everywhere, because it has contiguous memory. If you need really hash tables, look for alterna alternatives. I used TSL Hopscotch map two or three years ago, because at the time Swiss tables at F14 hash map were not available. Uh, I don't have like benchmarks to compare those three, so you should compare those by yourself to find out which one proves the best for you. But those are better, faster hash maps than the ones in the standard. If you want to pre-allocate storage, you may either implement your own free list, or maybe try using PLF Colony. This is a container that's, that's being proposed for standardization. This is a really nice container for, uh, let's say, pre-allocating. It's, it's really like a free list, um, enclosed and clo and with some STL-like interface. Maybe sometimes consider storing only pointers to objects in the container to make it like uh, smaller elements in the container. And also if hash is expensive to compute, um, store pre-calculated values together with the hash sometimes. And limit the, the number of type conversions. Uh, talking about the software design, keep the number of threads close 
less or equal to the number of available physical CPU cores if you decided to use several cores on your machine for the software. Do not make it more because you will just lose on latency. Maybe you will gain some on performance. Uh, separ separate IO threads from business logic threads. Use fixed size log free queues, busy spins to wait rather than uh, use some OS uh, kernel uh, waiting time. Use optimal algorithms, data structures, data locality principle here. Learn algorithms. Um, I really recommend you going to Connor Hextra uh, talks from this year and algorithm intuition. They are simply great. He, this is the guy that really knows a lot of, about algorithms in different languages, so you can learn a lot from those. I think that there are already three or different parts of, of, of this talk. I think that there was part three on code dive last, last week. Pre-compute what, whatever you can. Use compile time instead of runtime because it doesn't cost you in, at runtime at this point. The simpler the code, in most cases, is the faster it is. Do not overcomplicate stuff. Do not to be smarter than the compiler. In many cases, compiler knows better. Compilers are really, really smart right now. Know your language, tools, libraries. Uh, know your hardware. Think about caches. Bypass the kernel. Use user mode drivers wherever possible. And the last and the most important suggestion, measure. Measure the performance, always measure performance. If, if you are about to take out anything or, or one thing from this, from this talk, is this one. Always measure your performance. Um, I always think that I know how the code execute. I think that I have quite good uh, understanding of the, of the code and of the hardware, but I'm really often wrong. Only if I measure, I know that I, that I proved right. And you have to measure not only once, but the best is to just m have performance measurements in your CI system um, process. So in every change you introduce verifies if your performance was not worse. If you're measuring stuff, remember that things like CMake do not use release by default. This is one of, of the problems that my colleague had. He said that he really observed really bad performance when you are using like CMake on Linux, but Visual Studio on Windows is much faster. By default, CMake do not use release build, yes? Make it straight here. I uh, prefer hardware-based black box testing if you can afford it. So there are some hardware stuff that you can connect, for example, to network on both ends of your, of your server, and they just measure the, the delay between those. If you have to do it in server, uh, you may use profiler. But Profiler always also somehow changes the, the profile of your application. It's not for free. If you want to use Profiler, at least for Linux, you compile the code with no omit frame pointer flag, because this one will preserve frame pointer, which will make stack traces look nice. Yeah. Um, so familiar, familiarize yourself with performance tools for Linux, or maybe Xperf on Windows, or with tools like Intel Vitune, because those help, help a lot. You may also look to the assembly code in Godbolt, Explorer, or other stuff. Mm. Talking about flame graphs, I have only one picture at the end to show you what, it, what I mean by this. This is a flame graph of the application. You may exactly find out what is the bottleneck and try to optimize. This is how a flame, flame, flame graph looks like. And with this, I'm done. Uh, we, lo we just uh, killed three, three microphones. So uh, I have the only one probably that's working or, oh, okay, but we have more batteries. So if you have any questions, there is a microphone for you. So come here and ask a question. I have a question about uh, suggestion not to use node-based data structures. Uh, uh, I think uh, the advice should be if you can, uh, because sometimes we need stable uh, references or pointers to ele uh, container elements, and we can't avoid 
Mm -hmm. or, or we can. Mm. Yes, so as I said, don't use list, map, and all that map, but because all of this, those are node based. Uh, if you want to have stable pointers, like in case of std list, you may look for this PLF colony library, which is which is really nice nice way of doing this without having node based container. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, I had uh, one more of a comment. Yeah, and a question maybe. Yeah, you talked about optional. Why uh, and uh, it added bool, but it also added like uh, eight bytes of memory. Yeah, in but it uh, in your example it may be put in the beginning of your structure, and you had a padding, and you you had a car uh, in the beginning of your structure mm -hmm. x and maybe it is possible to implement optional in a better way, uh, like when I can prove that I can put my bull in the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't remember the yeah. slide. Yeah, so it should be somewhere here, right? Um, here? No. 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 I'm just thinking too, too close to. Yeah, to you to have to a lot of slides, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so let's continue. I will not uh, this yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you, if, if you put uh, like your bool for optional mm -hmm. in the beginning of the structure, you would have used your padding and you would have not uh, increased the size of your structure and it seems that optional is implemented not in the best way possible, yeah? Am I, am I right? Um, I don't think so, because optional anyway is an aggregate. It's an aggregate of type T and in the Boolean flag. So basically, it always has uh, alignment of, of the bigger one, so probably the type T. So if type T is more than one byte, then, then you, uh, do you have padding already there. Yeah, but why, why is it implemented that like uh, the, this way? Why, why, why is it in the standard this way? Because so. you cannot do aggregate in a different way. You cannot say like, like, like uh, if you have two fundamental types to put into, into one structure, it will always be um, is the smallest one, so it will always align to the, to, the, to the bigger one. Okay, yeah. And the second thing was about also optional, uh, optional in GCC at least, uh, till uh, GCC 8 uh, is not even trivially copyable for optional of int. So that's a big perform may, may be a big performance issue. So my advice would be try to uh, always use the latest compiler, and yeah, that's yeah. So using the latest toolchain is really really important. I can only agree with this. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, could you return to a slide with uh, exceptions? Well, okay, uh, uh, let's try it. Probably it's somewhere here. Uh, my question is, uh, it seems like I found a little inconsistency in your presentation because you advised uh, to assume that all function can throw exceptions. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you advised us next on the following slides to use const or to use no accept. Uh, I no said no accept, I said const exp. Const exp, oh, can we? I didn't talk about no accept, I think, this time. No accept? Well, maybe I'm wrong. And okay, <laughs> let's check after. Yeah, if I ever said about no accept, um, but not only during this talk, no accept is really useful for move semantics. So you should always put no accept to move constructor, move assignment operators, and swap functions. This is where it's useful. For other cases, uh, it's questionable. You may gain some assembly co code, may probably you will not be able to measure the difference, yeah, and you may end up with terminate hell. I've already been there. I don't recommend you being in similar situation. Um, thank you for a great talk. Uh, and I have a question about uh, DOD, mm -hmm. uh, the data-oriented oriented design. design, right? right. Mm -hmm. So uh, say uh, we have some legacy code, and we want to find such uh, problems in our legacy code. Mm -hmm. Is there any tools that will help us to do so? So I mean to profile and to understand where some memory access are, well, like, collocated in time but not collocated in memory aligned space. Uh, I don't know about any single such tool. For sure you can use Clang Tidy, you can use sanitizers. 
to verify your, let's say, legacy application for, for bugs and, and obvious problems. Um, there are also some, some tools that allow you to, to walk through the application but will not provide any statistics. I know that, I think it's Source Insight, right? Was open source lately? Can you? Source Trail, right, source trail. Source trail, right. Yeah, it was open source, but this allows you to, to move through the application rather and then learn n new code base rather than find out the problems there. But there are some tools that, that allows you to walk through and to verify with, with as, as, as sanitizers, but I don't know any of them that will be like scoped only on the performance and find those anti-patterns, let's say. Okay, thank you. And another question, there was a nice uh, picture or uh, table with the memory access uh, times, I guess, profiling of uh, cache memory. Well, mm -hmm. after you showed yep. us mm -hmm. these two uh, loops. And uh, can you tell what tool you use to obtain that? This is perf. Th these are perf. I just perf. Yeah. Th OK, yeah, thank These you. are tools from the, from the kernel uh, suit. OK, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Linus kernel. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, you mentioned an approach of recalculating a table of function values and it was uh, on the slide with factorial. Do you yep. use it often? And if so, what do you prefer? Code generator that generates a C++ module with a table or doing it at runtime before running the main calculation thread? Mm. So do I do this often? Probably not that often that, 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 that in my case, but there are some other domains that use a lot of constants or typical, or or typical inputs. And for those, it may be really useful. That's why I mentioned that. And I, I would prefer to do everything at compile time if possible rather than runtime. So I wouldn't do this in runtime. As long as I can use the same implementation for both, I would prefer compile time. If I have, um, if I have to write two different implementations, as I said, two different set of bugs, then probably runtime will be better cost. But right now we don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the suggestions was to write, always write um, exceptions that they uh, code, even if you don't use exceptions. And I'm not really uh, understand what it means. Probably you can provide any example of how to write exception safe code, uh, code if you don't use exceptions? Yes, yeah, so first of all, use RII pattern. So resource acquisition is initialization. Use smart pointers, use containers, do not play with resources by yourself. This is, this is the one biggest uh, suggestion I can provide to you, yes? So f write your code in a way that exception could, could be thrown from, from a, a, any position. And, and, and even if it's not. Then, then your code is safe, and actually it's not only for exceptions, it's actually much easier to use, much easier to write, mu much easier to maintain that way. Uh, and that my next question is, should we worry about uh, possible TLB cache misses, and should we use, for example, huge pages, what's your opinion, for low latency? Yeah, as I also provided, it said you may try to pin stuff to specific parts of memory. You can you can use arena locators that use specific specific pages from and and, and just dedicated pages for 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 those usages. Every trick that, that that pins your code to specific parts of the hardware makes your code in you can better reason about its performance. So every trick here is useful. Okay, so if you have any questions, find me after on the after party. I have the information from the organizer. We have 300 liters of beer waiting for us. <laughs> so let's meet there. Thank you very much. <laughs>